Hi everyone, my name is Dave Rosen. I'm a member of the colorectal surgery staff at the Cleveland Clinic. And today we're gonna to be talking about colon and rectal cancer, the diagnosis, workup, and staging. As we all know, times are uh, different right now as we're practicing our social distancing. So you can see I'm uh, recording this lecture from my home, which I thought was going to be my office, but as you can see from behind me, it's just all my uh, kids' books. So please do not make fun of me for that. All right, so let's get right into talking about uh, colon rectal cancer. So the first thing I think that's important to think about are what are the signs and symptoms? Because I think as uh, you'll be seeing these patients in the emergency room or sometimes we'll get, you know, as, as a resident, you'll get consulted for uh, abdominal discomfort or pains and you always want to be thinking about could colon rectal cancer be in your diagnosis? So oftentimes the uh, signs and symptoms are actually rather subtle, uh, but there are a few things that are uh, more of the red flag and that make us think about uh, we really should be focusing on, on colon rectal cancer. So the typical things are change in bowel habits, uh, weight loss, uh, people can complain of extreme fatigue. Uh, rectal bleeding is the obvious one that we always uh, think about. Very often these patients can actually be completely asymptomatic. Uh, this is a, it's something that's picked up on a screening colonoscopy, and that's the reason we do uh, screening colonoscopies, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Or sometimes these uh, can be picked up in an emergent situation, someone who presents with a uh, perforated colon cancer or a, a complete large bowel obstruction that ends up going to the operating room. So by the numbers, colorectal cancer is something that's very prevalent. And so it's something you need to be um, well aware of and uh, know this data uh, to be able to, to treat the patients that you're going to be seeing. Uh, so it's the fourth most diagnosed cancer annually, but it's actually the second leading cause of, of cancer death. Number one, uh, uh, the first cause, number one cause is lung cancer, and that's colorectal cancer. And then number three is prostate cancer in men and, and breast in women. Uh, in 2018, the, that there were estimated 140,000 cases, new cases in the United States, with over 50,000 deaths. Um, and the latest data we have puts a lifetime uh, risk of colon and rectal cancer at 4.5%. So who should be screened? I think... You know, it's a the the number we all have in our heads for average risk individuals is that at age 50 is when you should be uh, screened. However, the American Cancer Society just recently in 2018 actually recommended lowering the age of the initial screening to all for all average risk individuals to 45. That's a change that not all uh, cancer societies have adopted and followed suit. Um, but that is the American Cancer Society's recommendation. And so the question is, why did that change? Why, are, why is the American Cancer Society recommending screening patients uh, at a younger age than we used to? Um, and the, the, what we found is that although that recommendation of age four, less than age 45 was previously the recommendation for African Americans as the incidence uh, uh, at less than age 40, at less than age 50, excuse me, was higher in African Americans. Uh, however, that over time has, that incidence has remained relatively flat. But Caucasians who used to have a lower incidence of colon and rectal cancer uh, at less than age 50, it's actually been increasing as you can see here that these curves are, uh, or these lines are essentially the same now uh, for both African American and Caucasian populations. So you can see from these uh, two graphs here at the, the top graph, the number of cases for uh, less, than age, uh, less than age 50. That top graph shows you the, over the year of diagnosis, the number of cases for age 20 to 49 of colon and rectal cancer. And you see over the more recent years, it's steadily increasing for both men and women. Um, and it's not completely understood, but we'll talk about a little bit on the next slide why that might be. However, in the uh, second, the bottom graph there, you can see the cases of patients who are older than 50 has steadily decreased over time. Um, and this is thought to be 
due to increase in screening, prevention, and lifestyle modification as contributing factors. So we know that there are some modifiable risk factors uh, for colon and rectal cancer. Uh, they include smoking, uh, increase in you know a high use of uh, 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 tobacco or alcohol, both have an increased risk of colon and rectal cancer. Uh, as does a high a diet, excuse me, high in fat and low in calcium, folate, and fiber. Um, so we always want to be encouraging high fiber diet uh, to our patients. Um, there's some data about omega-3 uh, fatty acids as well. Um, and a lack of exercise as well as being obese and overweight are also um, modifiable risk factors that can help decrease your risk of colon cancer if you can fix them. Um, and we, when we look at the uh, increase in the uh, age less than 50 of colon and rectal cancer, we think a lot of this has to do with it. Um, you know, we think that there's a combination of uh, environmental factors, uh, diet, uh, exercise, obesity, um, all that play a role uh, into this rise that we've seen in, in younger patients having not only more uh, uh, greater incidence of cancer, but also aggressive cancers as well, uh, which is quite frightening. Um, so no matter what the age of people, I think if someone has presents to you, with, you know, rectal bleeding and some, uh, maybe some rectal pain, I think it's really important to do a uh, full exam and really treat this, even if they're 25, 30, 35, always have that in the back of your mind that this could be a colon or rectal cancer. It's not just always a hemorrhoid or a fissure or something uh, benign, um, although usually it is in that younger, younger age group, but you do, you don't just want to dismiss, uh, uh, cancer way is not a possibility. So how do we screen uh, individuals? There's there's you know average risk individuals and there's high risk individuals. And we're going to talk about the average risk individuals. There's both uh, uh, visual uh, screening as well as uh, various tests that can be run. The gold standard, the best way, the the the, the tried and true is the colonoscopy, and that's done every. 10 years for average risk individuals who do not have any uh, uh, polyps or other abnormal findings on their colonoscopy. Um, that's the best because it can be both diagnostic and therapeutic. Um, you can see the tissue, you can see the polyps, you can remove the polyps if there are any there, you can get them to the pathologist and get a pathologic diagnosis. So colonoscopy is the best. Uh, if patients cannot tolerate um, colonoscopy, due to anesthesia or for other reasons. Uh, there are some other options um, uh, to, to screen. One is a CT colonography, and that's recommended every five years. Flexible sigmoidoscopy every five years, a double contrast barium enema every five years are all part of the uh, standard recommendations that can be done. In addition, uh, other ways to screen are with a fecal occult blood test every year. A fecal immunochemical test every year or a stool DNA test every three years. Um, so a lot of the discussion of these various screening uh, mechanisms are done with by the primary care doctors. But I think it's important to know if if any of these things are any of the non-colonoscopy methods of screening are positive, the next step is a colonoscopy. And that's what the patients need to understand is that they don't necessarily get out of having a colonoscopy because no one wants to drink the prep. That's what everyone uh, doesn't want to deal with. Um, although a lot of the preps now are better than what people remember with the four liter uh, jug of Go Lightly. Uh, people, a lot, there are newer preps that patients tolerate well, but that is still, a, the Go Lightly still is a prep we use as well. Um, but they're not getting out of it necessarily because if any finding is positive, then they're going to be getting a colonoscopy anyway. All right, so that's a uh, introduction on um, how we screen um, and then now I'm going to, and, and, di and diagnose, and now we're going to go into uh, the staging. So, you know, when you've, the, usually these are picked up by colonoscopy, uh, you then uh, get, take biopsies, you get a pathologic diagnosis, which in colon rectal cancer is adenocarcinoma. Um, and then, so then you want to go about uh, staging the cancer. And so when you look at the, the AJCC staging criteria, there's a lot of numbers on this graph, and it's really like, oh, man, how am I ever going to remember these numbers? 
But colorectal cancer actually, staging is actually, it's one of the easiest ones to remember in the general surgery subspecialties. Um, so you have stage one through four. And then I tell people stage four is metastatic disease. Okay, so it's moved to some other uh, organ besides the originating, you know, the primary cancer, whether it's the colon or rectum. Stage three means it's moved to the lymph nodes. There are lymph nodes that are positive. And then stage one and stage two means it's within the uh, colon or rectum itself and it has not uh, uh, moved to the lymph nodes um, uh, or to another organ. That's what stage one or two is. And so in T1, and stage one is T1 or T2, N0, which means T1 means it's in the, the submucosa, T2 means it's invaded into the muscularis propria. And then stage two is either T3 or T4, N0. So T3 means it's moved through the muscularis, through the muscle wall of the colon, into the pericolorectal tissues, or T4, and then T4A means it's penetrated uh, to the surface of the visceral peritoneum, and T4B means it's adherent or invaded into other organs or structures. So the, the breakdown, though, if you just remember, stage four metastatic, stage three lymph nodes, stage one and stage two, just in the colon or rectum, I think that'll help you. It's important to accurately stage these things um, because you... And, and it's not only stage, but it's important to catch these early because the five-year survival rate really drastically changes if you can get to these early. Um, you can see that when the cancer is distant in stage four, your five-year survival really, really drops um, to you know as low as 13.8% versus if you're you know, localized in a stage one or stage two, your five-year survival is about 90%. So you can do patients a real good deed by catching this early and that's why we're uh, we harp on people to everyone to get their screening colonoscopies so the staging itself of the colon and, and and rectal cancer is slightly different between colon cancer and rectal cancer so first we're going to talk about colon cancer um, and staging is done with a ct scan of the chest abdomen and pelvis with iv and oral contrast as recommended by the nccn guidelines um, i think some places get often do it without the oral contrast, but the official recommendations are still with oral contrast. Um, and what you're looking for here is evidence of metastatic disease. You know, the two most common places that colon rectal cancer metastasize to are the liver and the lungs. And so that's really what you're trying to get a sense of um, with the CT scans. Also make sure there's not a big bulky tumor invading other uh, structures. And you also want to get a CEA level because it's good to know your baseline level because you can compare that to uh, track over time to monitor for recurrence. So that's your staging workup for colon cancer. Now, rectal cancer, you're still getting that same CT scan of the chest, abdomen, pelvis to look for the metastatic disease, and you're still getting the CEA level. But you also want to assess uh, the local status of the disease with an MRI with contrast. And that's now the standard recommendation. Endorectal ultrasound used to be uh, recommended. Um, but now it's actually only recommended if MRI is contraindicated for any reason, whether it's a pacemaker that's non-compliant or they can't get the contrast for some reason. Um, and the reason that we did this is endorectal ultrasound was able to tell us about lymph node status, but what we've realized recently, what's more important is the circumferential resection margin, meaning looking at the borders of the mesorectum, which is that envelope surrounding the rectum, and we want to know is the tumor or any lymph nodes invading out beyond that area that will be coming out with the specimen because that helps tell us what we're dealing with locally um, and might help guide our, our decision about neoadjuvant uh, chemo radiation or neoadjuvant therapy. Um, and so that's the other thing the MRI helps with is what is our need for, um, do we need any neoadjuvant chemo radiation or neoadjuvant therapy in general? And there's a lot of new data coming out um, talking about the uh, neoadjuvant chemo radiation versus long course versus short course radiation. Do we do total neoadjuvant therapy, meaning the chemo radiation and the chemotherapy before surgery? Is there a difference in the order we do it? Chemotherapy first, chemo radiation first, et cetera. But the, and that's a whole long uh, discussion itself. But I think for uh, the, the, to try to make it as basic as possible, in the MRI, if you find stage two or greater disease, I mean T3 or T4, N0, or any positive nodes, then you're going to need to uh, start with neoadjuvant therapy of some kind. 
Uh, we know that radiation, regardless of the type you're going to be giving, is best in the neoadjuvant setting. Um, and so that's what the uh, MRI is helping us determine, and, and we'll continue that on a, uh, another lecture. That's a whole other lecture, and it's a more advanced lecture in itself. One other thing you can, you know, I want to point out anatomically that can help you correlate with the MRI findings is your endoscopic exam. Uh, looking at the uh, the rectal valves here, and you can see there are typically there are some variations, but most people have three uh, rectal valves, and what you'll see is they don't correlate perfectly. As everyone's a little bit different, but usually the peritoneal reflection um, is around the second valve, somewhere between the uh, uh, you know the distal and the proximal valve, and so some people refer to them as the first, second, and third valves. I think it's easier to think about them anatomically if you talk about proximal, mid, and distal, because then you're not confused. Are we counting one, two, three from distal to proximal, or one, two, three from proximal to distal? The reason this is helpful to see endoscopically is it gives you a sense as to about where is the peritoneal reflection. And typically, it's around that mid to proximal valve. Um, there are times I've seen where it's as low as the distal valve. Um, and the reason that's important is that peritoneal reflection is where as surgeons, we separate from colon cancer to rectal cancer. And in another lecture, we're going to talk about surgical principles, and we'll talk about this a little bit more. But above the peritoneal reflection, we treat like colon cancer, which is often um, does not require any new adjuvant treatment. Where below the peritoneal reflection, we often, if it's stage two or above, like I said, we treat that like a rectal cancer, and that would get some kind of neoadjuvant therapy. And the last thing I'll point out here uh, anatomically that uh, as surgeons helps us uh, uh, plan our surgery is seeing the surgical anal canal, uh, which extends from the anal verge, the most distal aspect of the uh, anus, up to the uh, where the uh, you see the levator muscles there, and that's sort of the border where uh, the the most distal border where we can do our dissection distally on the rectum without invading the uh, sphincter muscles, and and that helps us uh, knowing if a tumor is its relation to the anal rectal ring it helps us know are we going to be able to uh, restore intestinal continuity, meaning getting this patient together, or will they need a permanent colostomy with abdominal perineal resection. Um, that's just a little uh, brief sneak peek, but that would be another lecture too, talking about uh, 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 surgical principles, and we're going to do that in another lecture uh, here soon. So with that, um, that's kind of all I have to say on the uh, diagnosis, uh, workup, and staging. Uh, as a little plug to something we do here at Cleveland Clinic, I'd like to, end telling, to tell you about a program called Surgery Live. This is a, a live webcast case discussion that uh, I moderate along with some of my uh, partners and other subspecialties. It's, uh, we're starting it back up and inviting everyone to come and tune in and join. It's from 6.45 to 7.15 in the morning Eastern time on the second and fourth Friday of each month. Uh, and the next session, you know, we've taken a little hiatus for uh, our dealing with the coronavirus pandemic, but we're starting back up on April 24th. You can see, we used to be on Tuesdays, so if you see that on the website, don't get confused, we're actually switching back to Fridays. It'll be the second and fourth Friday of each month, and that'll be our consistent time. And you see the website here, you can go to our uh, DDSI Consult QD Live website that's listed there. And if you see the Surgery Live um, uh, videos, there's a group of videos that we've done and you can check out the old ones. And we'd love to see you come join us. If you have any questions about that, don't hesitate to reach out to me uh, or anyone at um, uh, in the surgery department at Cleveland Clinic. And uh, we'd be happy to go through how to get you guys uh, in, in the invitation to log into the webcast, whether it's just to watch or to uh, participate. We love to have as many institutions as would like to participate. So let your program directors know if it's something you're interested in. I think it's a great opportunity. Thanks so much for tuning in for the uh, honor of inviting me to present to you guys. I uh, hope you learned something and uh, I'll see you soon for the uh, surgical principles talk. Take care.